Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this talk, Intro Plus Deep Dive uh, Provider IBM Cloud. My name is Sadev Zala. I am one of the lead for the project. And with me, uh, I have uh, Richard Thies and Brad Topol. Would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yeah, definitely. I'm Richard Thies. I'm working on IBM Cloud Provider for Kubernetes and OpenShift. Also co-lead with uh, Sadev on the Cloud Provider project for IBM Cloud. Hi everyone, I'm Brad Topol. Uh, I'm IBM's Distinguished Engineer for Open Technologies and Developer Advocacy. I lead a large team that contributes upstream to Kubernetes and I'm a Kubernetes contributor, a kubedoc maintainer and chair of the Kubernetes SIG doc localization subgroup. All right, well, thank you, Richard and Brad. All right, so uh, in today's talk, uh, we will provide an overview of uh, SIG Cloud Provider. Uh, there will be a separate talk for SIG Cloud Provider itself. So, you know, I would highly recommend uh, you to attend that to know more about the Cloud Provider SIG. But in this talk, I will just brief about it. Uh, being the provider, IBM Cloud is a sub project of the SIG Cloud Provider. We'll talk about the structure and activities of the provider IBM Cloud project. And that will be followed by deep dive to IBM Cloud Provider and Cluster API Provider IBM Cloud. All right, so uh, just to brief about uh, Cloud Provider Special Interest Group, uh, it is one of the uh, you know, 30 plus uh, special interest group in Kubernetes. It owns Kubernetes Cloud Provider interface. Uh, this interface is responsible for running all the Cloud Provider specific control groups. Uh, you can find uh, more about the you know code at the URL that I have provided here. Um, the SIG it ensures that the Kubernetes ecosystem is evolving in a way that is neutral to all cloud providers. So you know there's no favor given to one cloud provider uh, over other, uh, and uh, you know everybody's uh, everybody can participate uh, in the ongoing discussions and you know the implementation of a specific cloud provider. The SIG also ensures uh, a consistent and high quality user ex experience uh, across different cloud providers. And it owns all the sub projects. Uh, they were formerly known as you know, uh, SIG uh, themselves you know, for different cloud providers like SIG AWS or uh, SIG for Azure, uh, GCP or SIG IBM Cloud, um, SIG OpenStack, uh, SIG VMware and so on. Uh, the provider IBM Cloud, it's a sub project of this uh, SIG Cloud Provider. Uh, as I mentioned, there will be a separate talk on SIG Cloud Provider itself. Uh, so I would highly recommend you attend that to know more about uh, the Cloud Provider SIG. And you can also uh, see and refer documentation in the URL that I have mentioned at the, uh, at the bottom of the slide. Uh, rest of this talk will focus on the provider IBM Cloud. Already, so uh, uh, this sub project of you know Cloud Provider SIG, uh, it's uh, it's around building, deploying, you know, maintaining, supporting, and using uh, Kubernetes on IBM Cloud. Uh, obviously, you know it will uh, it will provide you a platform to interact uh, with the team, uh, you know the IBM team uh, and and others that you know the build and operate IBM Cloud. Um, and and you know we openly discuss uh, you know things like you know kind of contributions enrollment uh, that uh, you know we will be doing in the Kubernetes community from the IBM Cloud perspective, and uh, you know as part of this uh, sub project as an active uh, member or just following uh, it you know you you get uh, to follow the evolution of the IBM Cloud platforms. Uh, with respect to Kubernetes and you know related uh, CNCF projects. All right, so uh, the structure of the project, uh, you know, when we talk about it, we have three uh, colleagues. Khalid Ahmed uh, is from IBM Multi Cloud Manager side. Uh, we have Richard Thies, uh, who is one of the speakers here today. Uh, he uh, represents IBM Cloud Kubernetes Service uh, and uh, Red Hat OpenShift Kubernetes Service. And then myself, uh, I am uh, representing more from open source software side. Um, um, you can 
um, find some of the link here that will be useful, uh, you know, like mailing list. So I would highly recommend to uh, be part of the mailing list to get updates on the project. Uh, we have a, a Slack channel, uh, which the, the provider IBM Cloud Slack, uh, you know, I highly recommend uh, to be, uh, you know, to, to, to be there to see what's going on. You know, we provide the updates and other things there regularly. And you can find more about the project uh, documentation on the on the link I have provided here on, uh, for the GitHub. All right, activities. Uh, we meet every month, so it's last Wednesday at uh, two p.m. Eastern time. Uh, we have a you know thirty to forty-five minutes, or sometime an hour meeting, uh, depending on the agenda. Now, all the recordings for the meeting are also available. Uh, you know, so if you have missed the past meetings, if you cannot attend future meetings, you can refer to the videos and, and take a uh, look there. Uh, we regularly participate in the SIG Cloud Provider channel activities, you know, their bi-weekly meetings and other things. Uh, the project uh, owns a sub-project called Cluster API Provider IBM Cloud, uh, which is uh, an extension of uh, the Cluster API project of Kubernetes, right? So the Cluster API project, it's itself a sub-project of Kubernetes and it provides uh, you know, uh, optional uh, additive functionalities on top of core Kubernetes to manage the life cycle of uh, Kubernetes cluster. Now Brad will be uh, uh, giving a, uh, uh, more details there later in this presentation. And then, uh, you know, uh, we are uh, staying on top of uh, support for out of pre IBM cloud provider in C cloud provider. You know, that discussion has been going on for, for some long time uh, in the meetings through the mailing list, uh, uh, through the different talks that uh, some of the uh, provider specific uh, code, which were part of the Kubernetes uh, Core, they, they are taken uh, you know, outside uh, and that's called out of pre. Uh, so Richard will provide a deep dive uh, onto the IBM Cloud Provider and he will also cover uh, the out of pre topic there. Uh, with that, uh, Richard, I would uh, hand it over to you. All right, thank you. So yeah, I'll be taking you through um, IKS Rocks and our cloud provider. And we'll start here on IKS, which is IBM Cloud Kubernetes Service, which is IBM's managed Kubernetes service. So you can create kube clusters in IBM Cloud. Um, and there's a lot of other managed services out there. And so in, in a similar fashion to those, we are a certified Kubernetes provider through the uh, CNCF certification program for Kubernetes. So if you'd like more information on that service, you can check out the link on the docs there. And we try to keep updated on, you know, what's going on in IKS and um, post things on the Slack channels to keep you um, updated on those activities in our meetings as well. So with that, could you go to the next slide, please? Yeah, sure. Thank you. So this year, um, we've already provided three releases of IKS, based upon their um, associated kube releases that were out. And then when we were talking last year at this time, um, we were touting 116 just came out, right? And now you can see in this chart here, um, we support 117, 18 and 19, which is the three latest releases from this year. Um, and 116 is already deprecated. So you can see at which uh, the speed at which uh, Kubernetes moves, it's pretty significant. Um, and our 115 release is now unsupported. It just went unsupported a month ago. Uh, so uh, one of the things that take away for a lot of folks when they get on board in Kubernetes is that it moves fast and that you have to have a plan for change right away so you can keep current. Um, so there's been a lot of discussions in the Kube community about this and it certainly impacts users directly uh, that are uh, working with Kube and those obviously through managed services, which um, provide Kubernetes as a service or a product, right? Um, they're built on the, the service um, um, iterations and the service cadence from Kubernetes. So, you know, a lot of folks are trying to stay current. Um, there was a discussion on the long-term support for Kubernetes, what that might look like. A um, few things changed this year with COVID and other things happened. The delay of 119 uh, release was noted and 116 was extended for a little bit more having support. Ideally trying to allow people to maybe only have to upgrade once a year their clusters. Um, so in the, the current discussion that um, is going on in the community and feel free to um, 
contribute to that is whether or not Coop should have three releases a year or four. Um, and right now what I've seen is a little bit more weighted towards three people prefer, but certainly uh, keep, keep uh, your feedback coming to the community so they can make good decisions on these things. Um, and, and as far as patch releases, Kubernetes did a great job this year getting a very good cadence on delivering patches for the supporter releases. They generally do it monthly, uh, about mid-month. They patch all the releases at the same time, which has been really helpful, especially for managed services, and I'm sure for products as well, to be able to deliver those patches quickly and in a timely manner, very consistent manner. And we've been doing that as well. So next slide, please. Um, so Red Hat, OpenShift on IBM Cloud, or the Red Hat OpenShift Kubernetes service is another managed service. Again, OpenShift built on Kubernetes. So this is a also a Kubernetes certified offering through the CNCF. Um, and, and Red Hat builds on that Kubernetes-based capability to give you some additional functions with uh, Brad we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and if you want more information, I, I included a link there for, for OpenShift. And next slide, please. For the release uh, standpoints, we've delivered three releases of Rocks this year. So very similar cadence um, to IKS. Um, you can see each version of um, OpenShift is based on a version of Kubernetes. So the latest one for five that we've delivered is based on Kube 118. And we fully expect a 4.6 soon from Red Hat and OpenShift that will be based on Kube 119. And then certainly we'll be following that up and delivering that through the managed service as well. So you can see the impact of the velocity of Kubernetes carries over into the velocity of OpenShift. They're also moving very quickly. Um, um, now on the chart here, we, we show four, three, four, and five. Um, there also is a long-term support from um, OpenShift and Red Hat on 311. Uh, that's based on Kube 111. So that has a bit of extended life. We fully expect for a, a version of four, I believe 4.6 will be a more of an extended life version from OpenShift to give you that, that additional support. But bearing in mind that obviously Kube has not supported um, 111 for quite some time. All right, next slide, please. Just, yeah, one back if you, thank yeah. you, no problem. All right, so um, we have I IKS, we have Rocks. They're both built on Kube. And, and one thing that's uh, very uh, noticeable when you look at Kubernetes is very pluggable, a lot, a lot, of, a lot of interfaces whether it's through um, like the API level CRDs and such, um, the cloud provider is no different. And, and, and there's um, various unique functionalities in each cloud and that uh, we need to provide through Kubernetes uh, uh, controlled interface. And that interface is the, the cloud controller manager or the CCM through the cloud provider. So that's the architecture that um, Kubernetes has today to support various clouds. Um, and we, leverage this architecture in both of our managed services. So on the control plane side is where you find the API server scheduler, the Kube controller manager, and it's also where you find in our managed services, the cloud controller manager, which is the key aspect of taking advantage of the cloud specific features that you need to deliver some of those key aspects of Kubernetes that you come to expect. Now on the worker node sides, uh, where you have the Kubelet and Kube Proxy, you know, they're obviously running on, on nodes within the cloud. Um, and those don't no longer have direct connections to the, um, the cloud, if, if you will. That was under the old architecture. They used to do that direct connections. And they're trying to free that up so that the control loops are contained and it's a much cleaner interface going forward so that the code that used to live in Kubernetes can more easily be extracted. Dependencies can be broken that were um, specific to cloud providers that we could get these um, rolled out into their own repositories to, to make it easier for everybody to both consume Kubernetes, but also to build um, cloud specific features for Kubernetes. So with that, next slide, please. So this, the cloud provider interface has uh, several key um, inter um, interface uh, functions that it provides. The, the biggest one for most folks uh, is the lo load balancer. So that is the interface where you're gonna deliver load balancer service to Kubernetes. Uh, so Kubernetes is gonna call the cloud provider to you know, create and delete and update load balancers. Uh, for the IBM cloud provider, depending on whether you're running on classic infrastructure or VPC, 
uh, our next gen infrastructure. Um, you have a little bit different load balancers that are available. Um, so in the classic, you have a network load balancer based on uh, IPBS or, or IP tables. It runs in cluster. And then when you go to the VPC infrastructure, you've got a layer, layer seven load balancer. And then you also have a network load balancer, uh, which is new in our 119 release that we just delivered. Um, there's also the instances, which is another huge one, huge component to uh, the cloud provider, which is managing the nodes. In particular, um, you, you want to know, say, where the zone, uh, region, uh, instance type of the node. So that can be data fed back to Kubernetes for important aspects of scheduling um, and, and so on. So those are, those are important pieces. Now, being the managed service, a lot of the bootstrapping happens as part of the managed service. And we take advantage of that through the cloud provider to deliver that data to Kubernetes. Um, the community has moved with this new architecture. They, they saw the need for a new instances V2 interface as part of the cloud provider. That was new in 119 as an alpha. It, it's gonna progress, I, I'm hoping to uh, a beta and we're looking at taking advantage of that. It's a little bit more streamlined interface to align with the, the new design of the cloud providers. And then we do uh, do some implementation for zones which is uh, needed for load balancer and, and scheduling. Um, we don't do anything for clusters and routes. Uh, we rely on the CNI or the container network interface. In our particular case for the managed service, uh, IKS, we use Calico and, and, and likewise for rocks. So we rely on that for doing routing. All right, next slide. Okay, and so a little bit about the future. So um, as always, um, I don't have it on here, but we continually take um, the data that we collect through um, running Kubernetes, both within the managed service based Kubernetes and then within OpenShift and uh, our managed service uh, through Red Hat there, um, delivering what we know and um, back to the Kubernetes community, what we learn to running Kubernetes at scale, problem security things, um, enhancements, um, feedback. We always try to deliver that back um, also being part of the cloud provider, we're looking to expand our role here, especially if we can open source our IBM cloud provider. Things are uh, aligning a little bit better as the Kube community works to extract and migrate all of those in-tree providers out of tree, uh, making it a lot more easier to work on dependency management, builds, release processes. They're all coming together to make it get us to a point where this is going to be uh, much easier for, for all cloud providers to, to deliver in the future. So with that, we'll be looking at improving our docs, our build and test release processes, um, aligning our Go dependency management with what Kubernetes does. Uh, so these are all the activities that we're working on right now and in the future. Uh, and that is it. I'll turn it over to Brad. Thank you, Richard. Yep. So the IBM Cloud Provider Project has as a sub-project the cluster API provider IBM Cloud sub-project. And um, if you're not familiar with the cluster API provider projects in Kubernetes, basically they provide a, a declarative model or approach and tooling to simplify the provisioning, upgrading and operating of, of clusters. Um, and so we have our active project in this space, the uh, cluster API provider, IBM Cloud. Um, and just to, just to see some of the basics here, there's always a target cluster. That's the cluster we intend to create and manage. There's the bootstrap cluster that is typically a smaller cluster that's used to help get things started and helps, helps to manage that target cluster. Um, there is a cluster control command. So there is a, a command line interface that um, is, makes life easy. It makes it easy to run the, the types of commands for, for managing the clusters. And you know, IBM is one of many vendors that, that has embraced uh, you know, this approach. So you can see the architecture here on the right if you're interested. Again, we have an active project in this space and uh, feel free to go check it out and see what the team is working on. Um, uh, lately, I saw they're working on some upgrades. So feel free to check that out. Uh, next chart, please, Sada. Sure. So one question that we always get in this session, the one question that always comes up is, what's the difference between Kubernetes and OpenShift? And um, so we're gonna go ahead and address it now because I'm sure it'll come up in the questions. But OpenShift is a Kubernetes distribution uh, from Red Hat that includes extra tooling 
to simplify cloud native development and also provides automation, automated operation support. So when you start doing uh, development for cloud native applications, um, if you're just getting started and you're gonna start running in production, it requires a lot of skills, right? So you need to be able to create container images and you typically need to know how to find a base image and then take your code and merge it into the base image and create the new image and push it to a registry. Um, and if you work with Kube every day, uh, well, maybe you're an expert at that and that's not so difficult. But if you're a large organization and you say have lots of Java programmers, lots of Python uh, developers, these are folks who wanna get the benefit of cloud native, but maybe don't have all those cloud native skills. So one of the things that OpenShift provides is image creation and deployment tooling that makes it real easy for a developer to just push a change to a Git repository. This is called source to image. And, and through OpenShift, it's able to recognize that, find the right base image, merge your new code changes into the base image and push it to a registry. And so taking care of all those details is reducing the amount of friction for a, a, a developer who doesn't work in cloud native every day and is an expert at Docker configs and, and what have you to be able to get up and running and, and run uh, their application in a cloud native fashion in a Kubernetes uh, environment. So OpenShift will also give you image and configuration change detection. The other thing that OpenShift does that's nice is it provides security guardrails. So when you run in production compared to running in just your development environment, you need to worry about security. And in Kubernetes, there's a lot of knobs that you need to turn to get the, the, the role-based access control correct. One of the things that OpenShift provides are security contexts or security profiles that make it much easier for a developer to get the right security that they need for production out of the box and not have to do a lot of, of knob turning for a lot of individual values that, that they're either guessing are properly configured or not. Um, similarly, uh, OpenShift in, in its default form is gonna prevent privileged containers by, for running by default. And again, why that's important is a privileged container is something that would have root access. And if somehow there's a security breach, those types of containers can cause way more harm than non-privileged containers. So OpenShift is gonna protect you in that way and also, also try and deter you from running with the default namespace. Again, that can cause some security issues as well. So a lot of tools to help you get up and running and provide production level security and reduce the level of expertise that your developers and operators need. And also what OpenShift provides is automated cluster size management. It'll automatically provision new worker nodes to increase the cluster size and it has great day two automated, uh, automated operation support. So automated installation, automated updates and cluster verger, version management. So a lot of features that, that become very, very valuable when you're ready to run in production. Um, so obviously IBM has just standard Kubernetes and OpenShift as Richard covered, but um, those are the differences. Next chart. And uh, so that pretty much concludes our presentation and we'd like to thank you for attending.